The Jim Crow system was one of rigid legal segregation, not just by custom, but also by law. Uh, it began not immediately after the Civil War, but in the 1880s and 90s. And we'll talk about why the delay uh, in the next few minutes. Uh, it was enforced by law. It was against the law to violate the rules of the Jim Crow system. Uh, and you could be imprisoned for it. Uh, but it was also supported by intimidation and by violence all the way up to lynchings, which were appallingly common. Along with this was the loss of voting rights for African Americans in the South, and that meant losing the ability to, to fight back. Uh, Southern politicians did not have to appeal to the votes of African Americans. That meant they, they were responsible to whites who were uh, racist. Now, the Jim Crow, Crow system lasted all the way into the 1960s, and it was only the Civil Rights Movement that finally uh, brought an end to it. Now, we know that in 1877, uh, Reconstruction officially ended, and uh, liberals in the North lost interest in it. They were, they were focused on other causes, and... Uh, Politically, it, it began to be a liability. Uh, you weren't going to gain anything politically by uh, supporting uh, rights for the freedmen in the South. Um, also, the Supreme Court did a very poor job of enforcing the Reconstruction Amendments. That would be the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments. The 13th uh, ended slavery, the 14th established citizenship, and the 15th established voting rights. But the court, for reasons we'll see, really didn't enforce these. There were also wealthy white Southerners who were afraid. Now, what were they afraid of? Uh, populism. Uh, it was uh, because populism, as embodied in the Populist Party, for example, would have united poor whites and poor blacks. And there were some, uh, at least limited, signs that this was beginning to happen. And the enemy would be corporations and railroads. So white Southerners uh, realized that they were in a minority. The wealthy white Southerners realized that they would be in a, in a minority if uh, this populist mentality spread. Uh, so they emphasized divisions on the basis of race and not class uh, to diffuse this, to take away the unity in uh, the populist movement. It was just like the psychology of Bacon's Rebellion in 1676. Uh, the that pattern has repeated itself any number of times in the South since then. Now, uh, voting rights were uh, limited and taken away from African Americans in a number of ways. Uh, you'll remember that during Reconstruction, uh, many, many African Americans did vote and did elect uh, members of Congress and local officials. Uh, but one way to attack this was through poll taxes. Uh, they're illegal now, but uh, they were uh, charges just to vote. And, of course, poorer people had a lot of trouble with this. Uh, there were property qualifications, uh, something that goes back to the early republic and the colonial period. Uh, you had to own a certain amount of property in order to vote. There were literacy tests, which were... Uh, administered in a very discriminatory way. Uh, the much harder tests were given to African Americans. And ironically, sometimes the people administering the literacy tests were themselves illiterate. Uh, and going hand in hand with literacy tests was uh, the grandfather clause. Uh, in many states, uh, it meant that there would be no literacy test if your grandfather could vote. Of course, if you were uh, descended from a slave, your grandfather could not vote. Uh, petty crimes uh, led to disqualifications for voting. Uh, and, of course, that severely limited uh, the, the rights of African-American men to vote. Of course, this was only men that were voting, uh, partly because they were arrested on the slightest pretext uh, for things like vagrancy, uh, they were arrested whenever the local sheriff uh, wanted to arrest them. 
and this would in some cases disqualify them from voting even after they had served their jail time. Uh, the Democratic Party saw itself in the South as a completely private organization uh, and they argued that they were not governed by the uh, 15th Amendment which prohibited uh, racial discrimination in voting. Uh, so uh, the Democratic primaries were often white only primaries and in the South, in what was called the Solid South for the Democratic Party, the real election was in the primary to see who would get to run as the Democrat. Uh, once you got to the general election, uh, it was already a foregone conclusion uh, who would win, and that would be the Democratic candidate. And if all else failed, there was physical intimidation. And until late in the century, ballots were not secret, so you could see uh, who was voting, how they were voting. But beyond that, when African Americans appeared to vote, uh, if there were KKK members and hoods and white sheets there, uh, it would be very obvious that uh, one would vote at his own peril. Now, if uh, this is true, that uh, voting rights were taken away systematically, then it should show statistically, and in fact it does. Uh, in Louisiana, uh, where one study was done, in 1896, there were more than 130,000 African Americans who were registered to vote, left over mostly from the uh, period of Congressional Reconstruction. By 1900, the number had dropped to about 5,000, and by 1904, it had decreased almost 99%. And in 1896, there were still 16 blacks in, this, in the Louisiana legislature, the same legislature that segregated rail cars. Uh, and of course, that was the year of the landmark case of Plessy versus Ferguson that we'll get to in a few minutes. Uh, and of course, uh, as time went on, uh, the Louisiana legislature would become uh, all white rather quickly. Now, what was segregated? Basically everything. Schools, restaurants, hotels, restrooms, theaters, waiting rooms, trains and buses, cemeteries, hospitals, drinking fountains. Uh, this was a, a system of uh, almost complete racial uh, separation. Uh, this was a common sight in the South. There's a drinking fountain. Segregation in the South was established as a matter of law. Uh, but in the North, uh, there was also segregation, although the law didn't normally require it. Uh, it's called de facto segregation. De de segregation, de or segregation in fact as opposed to de jure segregation, which is established by law. Um, and there were, of course, there were neighborhoods where uh, African Americans were restricted from living, schools, occupations, etc. and this still exists today, as we know. There are some schools, for example, that are all white uh, in right in the Detroit area. Um, now, there are some Supreme Court cases that uh, tell us a great deal about the, the way the courts operated during this period. Um, in uh, the U.S. versus Harris, 1882, the Supreme Court struck down any federal laws against murder and assault, uh, arguing that these were uh, a, a state matter, not a federal matter. Now, the problem is that if, you, uh, if these are racially motivated and you leave justice to uh, the state courts, uh, then uh, blacks are deprived of their uh, legal rights. They're deprived of justice uh, because they would face all white juries. They would face judges who were elected uh, only by white voters in an atmosphere of extreme racism. Uh, so the court system was no, in the South, the state courts were no solution at all. Uh, in 1883, the court struck down uh, an act of Congress, the Civil Rights Act of 1875, uh, which prohibited racial discrimination by private citizens. Uh, they said the 14th Amendment only prevented governments from denying the equal protection of the laws. The amendment says that no state shall deny the equal protection of the laws. 
but the court said this only meant state governments. Uh, so they uh, ruled that the uh, Congress had no power to uh, prohibit segregation in things like uh, restaurants, for example, or uh, hotels. Uh, so the, uh, the law was considered unconstitutional and it was nullified. Now, the most famous of all these cases, um, in Louisiana, a law passed in 1890 said that blacks and whites had to sit in separate railroad cars. Well, Homer Plessy deliberately sat in a white uh, rail car. He was African-American uh, because he wanted to be arrested to create a test case to establish a principle that uh, would apply to other people, many other people in his situation. Uh, but the court ruled against Plessy, establishing the principle of separate but equal. The fact that there were separate uh, rail cars did not mean that they were unequal, even though in reality uh, the, uh, the cars for whites were much nicer, but the court chose to ignore that. Uh, in a similar decision in Williams versus Mississippi in 1898, uh, the court upheld a state law that required literacy tests for voting. Uh, now, again, they looked at the letter of the law, not at its practical effects. Uh, they chose to ignore the obvious fact, for example, that uh, these tests were being administered in a highly discriminatory manner, uh, that uh, they were being used as a, a means of uh, prohibiting uh, African Americans from voting. Uh, but this uh, style of law, in which you just look at the law itself and not at society and not what's really going on, is known as dis declarative jurisprudence, and it's related to a strict constructionism. You just look at the law, you don't look at what's really happening in the real world. This would change in the 20th century, especially with the case of, of Brown versus Board of Education in 1954. That's a, a story for another day. Now, along with the legal uh, restrictions of Jim Crow, there were social rules. Uh, blacks were expected to show deference to whites, uh, to make it clear that they accepted their role as inferiors. Uh, even adult black men were called boy but uh, by whites, but, but of course, black men were expected to, to call what white men sir. Uh, and, and this was a, a deliberate system that uh, established and, and ratified uh, inequality. And anyone who violated it did so at his own peril. Uh, this could result in, in killings and lynchings. Uh, the, maybe the most famous example came in, in 1955 in the case of Emma Till, uh, in which he apparently uh, whistled at a white woman uh, and that cost him his life. Uh, lynchings were common. In about a half century, there were over 3,300 of them. The real, that we know for sure, the real number was undoubtedly higher. Some of them happened as late as the, 18, as the 1960s, uh, and convictions were very rare. Uh, and, and it was widely known in a southern town who was involved in the lynching. These were large group events. But somehow or other, uh, there were rarely any convictions for them. Uh, of course, this is a reflection on the Southern uh, court system. Uh, this was not limited to the South. You'll see one photo of a lynching in Indiana, for example. There it is. And, and uh, maybe what's most striking is that some people in the crowd think this is a, a good time. They're enjoying themselves. Uh, if you look at the uh, photo on the right, uh, some parents brought their children to this, and, uh, you know, it's, it's sort of a, a celebration. Uh, these are not easy to look at. Uh, you can get, uh, by, by looking at the actual slides posted, not, not from this link, but you will, you will uh, get a, a lynching video that will give you more information about a particularly egregious case. Now, there were protests against lynching, certainly. Uh, this one was in New York City, and the leader of the campaign against lynching was Ida B. Wells. Uh, she um, was a journalist and a lecturer, uh, 
who did more than anyone else to bring national and international attention to the problem. Uh, re related to this was the issue of white womanhood, um, the most explosive uh, thing that a black man could do was to have any sort of relationship with a white woman. Uh, now, Ida Wells uh, argued that these were consensual relationships, that no one was forcing anybody to do anything, uh, but that didn't make any difference. Uh, her editorial angered white Southerners so much that she was threatened with lynching herself. 